It was 1847 when a Scottish hymnist named Henry Francis Light, he wrote the lyrics to his famous hymn titled, Abide With Me. Well, it's interesting to note that this was the last song that he ever wrote because he uh, soon after died of tuberculosis. What's even more interesting, though, is that this hymn is actually the most common tune heard by those who suffer from musical hallucinations. Now, just to be clear, musical hallucinations, this is a a disorder uh, which causes a person to think that they're actually hearing music when that music is not actually being played. It's not just hearing a song in your head. It's actually the belief that you're hearing an audible song that's really not being played. According to recent research, the most common musical hallucination that people hear is Henry Francis Light's last hymn, Abide With Me. Now, the chances are most of us here today have never, ever heard this song, which was written in the mid-19th century. And and so if you're wondering how so many people are hallucinating a hymn that you've never, ever heard before, then it'll help us to understand that musical hallucinations are typically heard by elderly people who are losing their hearing. The average person who has musical hallucinations is elderly and has hearing loss. That being the case, it only makes sense then that a 19th century hymn like Abide With Me would be the most common musical hallucination heard by elderly people alive today. This would also explain why Tom is constantly singing Abide With Me. So if you ever hear him humming the tune, Tom, I said that's why you're probably hearing the song Abide With Me. Here in our study today, we're going to spend our time considering the value of abiding with the Lord. And we're going to consider the importance of abiding in the anointing of the Lord. And as we make our way through our text today, we're going to see, first of all, that believers abide in the anointing of the Lord by continuing in ecclesial fellowship. Secondly, we'll learn that believers abide in the anointing of the Lord by embracing biblical truth. Thirdly and finally today, we'll learn that believers abide in the anointing of the Lord by walking in spiritual power. With this as our outline, I'd like you to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2 because here we find the Apostle John encouraging his audience to continue abiding in their anointing. As you make your way to 1 John 2, I want to continue setting the stage for our text today. I want to do this by reminding you about the warning that John presented in our text last week. It was in verse 18 where John reminded his readers about the coming of the Antichrist. And not only did he mention the Antichrist, but he also reminded them about all of the Antichrists who had already come. And while this list of Antichrists included historical characters who were types of the Antichrist from history past, John was also warning them about the Antichrists who were attempting to deceive those believers there in the first century church. He was warning them about the Antichrists who were amongst them. But this is our focus. I'd like you to look with me here at 1 John chapter 2. We're going to begin reading at verse 19 because here John declares, they, speaking of those Antichrists, went out from us, But they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now I want to stop right here because I want to take a moment to identify the group that John is referring to as they. In order to do so, let's again back up. I want to take another look at verse 18 because here John declares, little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour. Then he says, they went out from us. Based on the context, it's clear to me that the group that John refers to as they in verse 19 is none other than the many antichrists who had 
currently come in amongst them there in the first century. And according to John here, these antichrists were made manifest as they forsook their ecclesial fellowship. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 19, because here John declares, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, that none of them were of us. Here in this verse, John was assuring the believers who belonged to the first century church that the Antichrist, who were among them, would eventually be exposed as such. And they would be exposed as they went out from the assembly of the believers. And in order to explain what this means, it'll first help us to understand that this word went, found there in the beginning of verse 19, it's translated from a Greek word which was used to describe those who would forsake their fellowship. That being the case, John wasn't referring to those believers who, who left the church in one city and then moved to another city and plugged into a church over there. He's not talking about those Christians. He's certainly not writing about those believers who would be sent out to accomplish world missions. No, he's not talking about those Christians. No, instead, John was talking about those who went out rather than those who were sent out. It's a big difference. There are those who are sent out by the leaders of the church and then there's those who just went out because they had their own agenda. It's in this sense that John was reminding his readers that there are those who are in the church, but they aren't of the church. There are those who are in the church, but they are not of the church. And listen, it's important for us to understand that the same is true today. Much like the first century church, the 21st century church has those who are in the church, but they are not of the church. In order to further explain how this affects us today, if you would hold your place here in the book of 1 John and turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. As you make your way to 2 Peter 2, I want to take a moment to remind you of a parable that Jesus presented when he described the way in which the devil came along and sowed tares among the wheat. In this parable, Jesus compared the wheat to the sons of the kingdom. And, and, and the tares, well, he compared the tares to the sons of the wicked one. Not only that, but according to Jesus, the enemy, who is the devil, uh, has come along and sown or, or planted tares among the wheat. Therefore, we really shouldn't be surprised when we find tares among the wheat within the church. This is precisely what Peter is describing here in 2 Peter chapter 2. If you would look with me here, beginning at verse 1, because here Peter declares, there were false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Here in these verses, we find Peter. He's warning the first century church about the false teachers who will join the ecclesial fellowship of the Christian church uh, with the goal of introducing destructive heresies. Peter even tells us here that these false teachers are antichrists who will go as far as denying the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's sad to say that there will be many believers who will embrace their destructive doctrines. There will be many believers who will follow after these false teachers. That being the case, it's crucial for Christians to realize that everyone among us isn't necessarily of us. Just because someone goes to church doesn't mean that they're a Christian. Paul confirmed this concern when he warned the leaders of the church in Ephesus that men would rise up from among themselves, from within the church, from, from within the ranks of the Christian church. Men would rise up, and Paul said they would speak perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. In other words, there's going to be wolves who come 
in sheep's clothing who creep into the church with the goal of dividing and destroying the fellowship. With that being the case, Paul wrote a letter to Pastor Titus, and in Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, he told Titus that he needed to reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. He's telling this pastor, look, if you have someone in your church who will not get behind your leadership and they continue to be divisive, reject them. After the first or after the second admonition, just reject them. Christian, listen, don't be surprised to find out that there's tares among the wheat. Don't be surprised if someone comes to you from within our fellowship and they begin to take issue with a doctrine that's being taught here in this church or, or they begin to present you with accusations against the leaders of this church. Don't be surprised by this. And, and don't just immediately believe them because they go to this church. The best way to handle these sorts of divisive people is by inviting them to discuss their new doctrinal idea in the presence of the pastor. Just tell them, hey, very interesting. I'd love to meet with you and Pastor Bungie so that we can talk about this new doctrine together. No harm in sitting down and talking about doctrine. I love it. They should be more than willing to, right? If it's that important for the church, then by all means, let's bring the pastor in. See what he has to say about it. We can open up God's word together. Examine the scriptures together. Or if some person comes to you with some accusation against a leader, let them know that you would like them to present their accusations in the presence of the leader that they're accusing. If they're bringing an accusation against a leader, then by all means, let's sit down with that leader. Let's see what they have to say about it. Let's hear the second side of the story. Nine times out of ten, that person is going to present you with some reason, some excuse for why a meeting like that isn't really necessary. And, and at that moment, you'll know. You're dealing with a person who's attempting to cause division. If they're unwilling to discuss new doctrines with the pastor, if they're unwilling to make the accusation in front of the person they're accusing, they're just being divisive. Don't follow after them. And listen, every time we choose to challenge these individuals in this way, we're simultaneously protecting our fellowship from the false teachers who are here to draw away disciples after themselves. This is quick accountability. And it ends up resulting in corrective measures, which might lead to church discipline. But I believe that it's in an ecclesial culture of this nature that we're going to end up sending these spiritual charlatans packing long before they have a chance to negatively affect our fellowship. You see, these sorts of false teachers who are exposed in this way, they're going to be quick to leave. They're going to realize that uh, they're not going to be able to spread their dissension here in this fellowship. And as they leave, they're going to reveal that they were really never of us. Conversely, though, the, the believer should be the one who abides in the anointing of the Lord by continuing to remain connected to the ecclesial fellowship where the Lord has placed them. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's turn our attention back to 1 John chapter 2. If you would look with me here at verse 19, because here John declares, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. Now, the word continued there, it's translated from a Greek word, which was used of those who would abide or remain or stay in the same place. And this is the same word that Jesus used in John 14 when he encouraged believers to abide in him. Same exact Greek word. Based on the meaning of this word, John seems to have been suggesting here that those who are truly part of the body of Christ will continue to abide within the ecclesial fellowship that we call the church. Or more simply put, real Christians will become those believers who are faithfully plugged into the church that God has called them to attend. Now just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that you have to go to church in order to be a Christian. We're not saved by works, we're saved by grace is received through faith. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And yet, we have to understand 
that the born-again believer who is walking in the anointing of the Holy Spirit is going to develop a desire which will lead us to become committed members of our Christian fellowship. Our connection here in our fellowship is a byproduct of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The person who says, nah, I don't need to go to church. Well, they're either an unbeliever who doesn't have the anointing of the Lord, or they're a believer who isn't abiding in their anointing. Because the anointing of the Holy Spirit will lead us to continue in our ecclesial fellowship. We will abide within our church. And according to John, this desire comes from this anointing that we have from God. As a matter of fact, look with me here at verse 19 again. Here John declares, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest and that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. That word anointing there, It's translated from a Greek word which spoke of the sacred oil that the Jews would use whenever they were consecrating their temple priests. Not only that, but this word was also used by the Apostle Peter when he described the day when God the Father anointed the Lord Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit. Now with this as our focus, hold your place here in the book of 1 John and turn with me to Acts chapter 10. As you make your way to Acts 10, I should take a moment to point out that the title Christ... It actually shares the same Greek root as the word translated anointing. Christ and anointing in the Greek share the same exact root word. Therefore, whenever we refer to Jesus as the Christ, that's not his last name. You know, there are those people who say, you know, Jesus H. Christ. Like that's his name. Middle initial H, last name Christ. But that's not the case. Jesus Christ is not his name. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. And it literally means that Jesus is the anointed one. When you say Jesus Christ, you're saying Jesus, the anointed one. And here in Acts chapter 10, we find Peter. He's describing the day when Jesus was anointed by God the Father with the Holy Spirit. He's he's talking to this group of Gentiles who were at the house of a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And with this as our focus, look with me there at verse 36, because here Peter declares the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Notice that. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Peter tells us that this happened on the day when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus there in the Jordan River. And and listen, much like the Jewish priests who, who would first be cleansed with water and then consecrated by being anointed with sacred oil, The Lord Jesus fulfilled those priestly pictures, those those Old Testament shadows. He fulfilled them on the day when he was baptized in the Jordan River, symbolizing the, the washing of the priest. And then he was anointed by God, but not with the oil of this earth, but rather with the Holy Spirit and with power. In similar fashion, I'm here to tell you that every born again believer has also been anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power at the very moment of our salvation. In order to prove my point, continue holding your place there in the book of 1 John and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. As you make your way to 2 Corinthians 1, I should take a moment to remind you that those who place their faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ have become the priests of the Most High God. And as such, God has anointed every born-again believer with the spiritual oil of the Holy Spirit so that we can become consecrated Christians who are sealed to serve him forevermore. This is precisely the point that Paul was making here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you would look with me here, beginning at verse 21, because here Paul declares, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. 
Now here in these verses, we find Paul assuring his audience that God has anointed every believer with the Holy Spirit of promise. And not only does this anointing confirm our consecration in Christ, but this anointing also seals us into the body of Christ so that the indwelling spirit serves as a guarantee of our salvation. He is the down payment of our redemption. Furthermore, the anointing of the Holy Spirit will fill our hearts with the desire to become believers who are continuing to abide in this anointing by plugging into the ecclesial fellowship to which we've been called. In order to prove my point, let's turn back to 1 John chapter 2. I want you to look with me again there at verse 19. Here John declared, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us but they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. I like the way that the scholars of the New Living Translation render the ver these verses. They put it like this. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. But you are not like that. For the Holy One has given you his spirit's and all of you know the truth. Simply put, John was letting us know that those who have truly been born again by faith in Jesus Christ have also been anointed with the Holy Spirit. And those who have been truly anointed with the Holy Spirit will abide in this anointing by continuing in communion at the Christian community to which the Lord has called them. And while it's true that believers abide in the anointing by continuing in ecclesial fellowship, it's also true that believers abide in the anointing by embracing biblical truth. But this is our focus. I want to begin to, to consider this second point. And so uh, let's continue making our way through this challenging chapter. If you would look with me beginning at verse 20, because here the Apostle John again declares, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is... Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. Now here in these verses we find John, he's continuing to encourage every believer to abide in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And based on these verses... We learn that the Christian who is abiding in the anointing of the Holy One is the believer who will be able to discern between which is, that which is true and that which is a lie. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 21 because here John declares, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. Or more simply put, the believer who abides in the anointing of the Holy Spirit is going to be able to understand what is true and what is not true. And all of this is going to stem from an understanding of biblical truth. In order to, to further explain what he means here, if you would, uh, John here points his audience to the anointing of Jesus Christ. And with this in mind, notice again there at verse 22. Here John illustrates this point by asking, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Now remember, Christ isn't Jesus' last name. Instead, Christ is the title which tells us that Jesus is the anointed one. Therefore, verse 22 could be rendered in this way. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the anointed Messiah? Or more simply put, those who deny the messianic anointing of Jesus are nothing more than liars. Not only that, but there in the second half of verse 22, John also labels these liars as antichrists. The reason why is due to the fact that those who deny the anointing of Jesus are actually anti-Christ. They're in opposition to Christ. And if that's not bad enough, they're simultaneously denying the testimony of God the Father and God the Son. Remember, Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, and, and at that moment, God the Father anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit, and as he did, he declared this. He said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Based on this, we must conclude that either Jesus is the anointed Son of God or God the Father was lying. Which is it? As we consider these options, I should remind you of something that Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews. 
It's in Hebrews 6, verse 18, where Paul tells us that it's impossible for God to lie. Impossible. There's no way for God to lie. Therefore, when he anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and declared him to be his beloved son, there's no way that he would have been lying. With that being the case, the Apostle John assures his audience that those who are denying the anointing of Jesus are simultaneously calling God the Father a liar. And since it's impossible for God to lie, then the correct conclusion is that the critics are the ones who are lying. The critics, those who say that Jesus is not the anointed son of God, they're the ones who are truly lying. It's important for me to point out here that these liars who are denying the anointing of the Lord Jesus, they actually believed that they were defending the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob against this cult of Christianity. And yet here in these verses, John assures his audience that these antichrists, they weren't defending God the Father. They were rejecting God the Father because they were rejecting his only begotten son. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 23. Here John declares, whoever denies the son does not have the father either. In other words, the person who denies the anointing of Jesus is simultaneously rejecting the testimony of God the father, which means that they're actually rejecting the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For the sake of clarity, John went on to present the same truth with with a positive spin. So if you would look with me there at the second half of verse 23, here John tells us that he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. It's basically the same statement, just put in the positive sense. That word acknowledge, it comes from a Greek word which means to confess openly or to profess publicly. Therefore, verse 23 could be rendered in this way. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either, He who openly confesses that the Son is Christ also has God the Father. Or more simply put, if you want to have a relationship with God the Father, then you must trust in his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Now as we consider what John is writing here, I can't help but to think about those who insist that we all just worship the same God. You probably know someone who's believing that right now. probably all know someone who insists that all these religions, they're all just you know, different paths up the same mountain. They're all just different roads to the same God. However, John was reminding his readers here that there aren't many paths to God. There, there aren't many different roads that lead us to God. No, instead there is one way to God the Father, and Jesus is that way. Period. You either believe in the Son and have a relationship with God the Father, or you reject the Son and you reject God the Father at the same time. Jesus is the way. As a matter of fact, Jesus confirmed this truth by declaring, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, when Jesus here declares himself to be the way to the Father, he wasn't leaving any room for any other way. He's saying, I am the way. And then he goes on to declare himself to be the truth. Therefore, he's not leaving any other room for, for, for any truth other than biblical truth. And this truth, which was introduced to the world through the messianic prophecies uh, of the Old Testament, it's the same biblical truth which was fulfilled in the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, this was the biblical truth that the apostles preached from the very beginning of the church age. And with that being the case, uh, John was encouraging every Christian here to abide in biblical truth. But this is our focus. Notice with me again there at verse 24, because here John declares, therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. Now, as we consider what John is saying here, It's interesting to note that the word abide, it's translated from the same Greek word which was translated continue uh, back in verse 19. Therefore, John was directing these disciples to continue embracing biblical truth. He's saying continue in that which you heard from the beginning. Continue embracing 
the biblical truth that the apostles have been preaching since the day of Pentecost. Or more simply put, he's encouraging them to abide in the biblical truths of the gospel message. And there in the second half of verse 24, John went on to assure his audience by declaring this. He says, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. In other words, the believer who continues to embrace the biblical truths of God's word will also continue to enjoy an abiding relationship with God the Son and with God the Father. And as we consider this encouragement, it's important for us to understand here how easy it is for believers to wander away from the simple truths that are found in God's word. And with this as our focus, if you would hold your place here in the book of 1 John, and let's turn to the 16th chapter of John's gospel. As you make your way to John 16, I want to remind you about an issue that occurred at the church in Galatia there in the first century. It was during the mid-first century. There there was a group of false teachers who entered the church there in Galatia, and they began to deceive the disciples with something that Paul referred to as another gospel, which is no gospel at all. According to Paul, even the apostle Peter ended up being led astray by these spiritual charlatans. And with that being the case, we must understand how easy it is for believers to wander away from the biblical truths of the simple gospel message. Thankfully, the Lord has anointed every believer with the Holy Spirit who is here to help us. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me here at John 16, we're going to begin reading at verse 7. Here Jesus declares, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Now, here in these verses, we find Jesus. He's presenting his disciples with the promise of supernatural help. And based on this promise, we can see then that the Holy Spirit, uh, who Jesus calls the helper, the, the Holy Spirit who was sent on the day of Pentecost, he has become the supernatural helper who was sent to enable the disciples by guiding them into all truth. And this certainly applies to the writing of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit helped the disciples of Christ to produce the New Testament. And Paul confirmed this truth for us in 2 Timothy 3 when he declared all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Or in other words, the word of God is the divinely inspired breath of God. Peter also confirms this in 2 Peter chapter 1 when he reminded us that the prophetic word of God was provided when holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What this means then is that the authors of the New Testament, they were anointed by the Holy Spirit to produce a book which presents us with the biblical truths that we need to know God. The Holy Spirit guided those New Testament authors to provide us with a book to give us all the knowledge that we need so that we can have a relationship with God. Therefore, the believer who wants to continue abiding in the anointing of God, we must spend time studying the word of God and embracing the biblical truths which are revealed to us in God's written word. If you want to abide in the anointing of God, uh, we need to continue in our ecclesial fellowship and we need to continue embracing biblical truth. Finally, I want to consider how believers will abide in the anointing by walking in spiritual power. And with this as our focus, let's turn back to 1 John chapter 2. I want to begin reading there at verse 26, because here the Apostle John declares, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, 
you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Now here in the final verses of this chapter, we find John, he's presenting the recipients of this letter with a little more insight regarding his reasons for writing this epistle. And there in verse 26, he explains to them that this didactic letter was designed to help them to identify the deceivers who were rising up from within their ranks. He's writing to them because there were deceivers among them. And knowing that there were many deceivers who were attempting to lead these disciples astray, John encouraged them to continue abiding in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 27. Uh, there John reminds his readers that the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. Or in other words, John was letting them know that when it comes to those deceivers who might lead us astray, born-again believers have nothing to fear. And the reason why is based on the fact that we've received the Holy Spirit who has taken up residence within us. We have an anointing within us. Therefore, we always have access to the one who was sent to guide us into all truth. It's for this reason that John went on to assure his audience by declaring, you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now, if we take the wooden literal meaning of this statement, then my study today is done and it's time to go home. You don't need that anybody teach you, right? So what am I doing up here? If we, if we take this statement in a wooden literal sense, then there is no need for this Bible study. Not only that, but this statement would also render this entire book as being unnecessary. And the reason why is that this book was designed to provide spirit-inspired teachings for every Christian throughout the entire church age. Why would John then write teachings to those who needed no teacher? Is he contradicting himself, or, or is this just a paradox that needs a little more understanding? Well, clearly it would be incorrect to conclude that John was teaching his audience that they had absolutely no need for teachers. That being the case, we should take a moment to ask, what did John mean when he told his readers that they didn't need anyone to teach them? Well, in order to answer this question, I want you to first look back at verse 20. There John declares, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Now, if you're one of those know-it-alls, uh, this isn't there to support you in your belief that you know it all. Uh, we don't know it all, right? And John wasn't really telling these disciples that they actually knew everything. No, if they, if they knew everything, then this letter is pointless, right? If they knew everything, then there would be no reason for this letter to be written because they would have already known everything that he would write. Therefore, that's not what he's saying either. Now, instead, John was leading his audience to understand that their anointing has given them access to the omniscient God. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit at the moment of our conversion and at that moment, we're immediately indwelt with the spirit of the omniscient or all-knowing God who is able to guide us into all truth. As a result, the Christian is able to now read the Bible and understand the scriptures without having a teacher right there guiding them along the way because we have the guide within. The Holy Spirit is within us and is ready to guide us into all truth. At the same time, though, I would also remind you that the same Holy Spirit who is ready to guide us in, into all truth has also spiritually empowered some men to serve as pastor teachers. Why? Why would the Holy Spirit empower some men to become pastor teachers if we don't really need human teachers? Seems to be a contradiction, right? Seems to be in conflict unless there's some other way to interpret what John is saying. I would explain it like this. John wasn't encouraging his audience to rid themselves of every human teacher, but rather he was directing these disciples to test every teacher. Remember, there are, there are those who are going to heap up for themselves teachers because they have itching ears that need to be tickled, right? 
And so he's directing these disciples, look, you don't need to go heap up for yourself a bunch of teachers here. But rather you need to test every teacher with the spiritual anointing which will lead you into all truth. Being the case, the Christian who wants to avoid the lies of false teachers, we must abide in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And as we abide in the anointing, well, then the Holy Spirit empowers every disciple to discern the difference between true teachers who have been spiritually gifted and anointed by God and the false teachers that he was warning them about here in this text. While there are those believers who are quick to go out and heap up for themselves those those false teachers because they have ears that want to be tickled, I would encourage you, test every teacher. Don't rush out to find teachers. If you're at home studying the Bible and you're scratching your head about a certain verse and, and you're wondering what it means, and spend some time in prayer. Don't rush out to see what every person on the Internet has said about that verse. Spend some time praying. And ask the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth. And then abide in your anointing, and he will. He will empower you to understand the word of God. And he will empower you to recognize false teachers so that you might not be led astray by those who would deceive us. Furthermore, he not only empowers us to recognize false teachers, but he also empowers us to walk in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 28, because here John declares, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Here in these verses, John lets us know that those who abide in the anointing of the Holy Spirit we're going to have confidence, so, or in other words, cheerful courage as we think about the second coming of Jesus Christ. There are those who, who, who are filled with fear as they consider the second coming of Jesus Christ. Others mock the idea, scoff at the, the second coming of Jesus Christ. But those who abide in him will have a confidence when we consider the second coming of Jesus Christ. We have a confident courage as we contemplate Christ's coming for the church. The reason for this confidence is based on the fact that those who have been born of God have been anointed with the power that we need to walk in his righteousness. And that's, that's the power that we have today, Christian. The Holy Spirit has anointed us with power so that we can walk in righteousness. Therefore, John encouraged us to abide in in, in him so that we have the power to practice or, or live according to righteousness. This is precisely the promise that Jesus mentioned to his disciples prior to his ascension into heaven. It's in the book of Acts, chapter 1, when he declares, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When the Christian is anointed with the Holy Spirit at the moment of their conversion, they receive power from the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the, uh, end of the earth. Christian, listen. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is an anointing of power. We've been given spiritual power from God. Therefore, the power of our anointing enables us to become witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, our witness, well, it's not just based on the words we preach. Sometimes we can think about witnessing in that sense. Uh, You need to go out and witness. That's that's when I go out and and talk about Jesus, when I preach the gospel. that, That is witnessing, of course. But every day you go to work, You're a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what kind of witness are you? How do you interact with your coworkers? Are you on time representing the Lord Jesus Christ and being punctual? Do you take office equipment home that doesn't belong to you? Do you talk about your boss behind their back with other coworkers at the water cooler? What kind of witness are you in the way that you live your life? 
we ought to be practicing righteousness so that the way we live corresponds to the words we preach. That's what it means to be a good witness. But the only way that we can be a good witness is by abiding in the anointing, which provides us with the power that we need to practice righteousness. That being the case, the Christian who wants to be a good witness for the Lord Jesus Christ, we must abide in the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that we'll have the power that we need. And listen, uh, with this is our goal, then I would conclude our study today by encouraging every Christian to become believers who are abiding in the anointing of the Holy Spirit by continuing in ecclesial fellowship. Continue being plugged in to your church. Become an active member of the church that God has called you to. And if it's Calvary South Austin, then, then I encourage you, plug in. Sir. Become a part of this functioning body so that you will abide in your anointing as you continue in ecclesial fellowship. We should become believers who are abiding in the anointing of the Holy Spirit by embracing biblical truth. We need to spend time studying God's word and understanding what it says, allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us into truth. We need to become believers who are abiding in the anointing of the Holy Spirit by walking in the spiritual power that we received on the day when we placed our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And as we abide in this anointing that comes from the Holy Spirit, we'll be able to become the sort of witness for the Lord Jesus who is leading many into his great grace. And so with that, let's abide in this anointing so that we can be, bring glory to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.